So uh, now we are speaking with Dr. Bruce Jakoski, who is a professor at CU Boulder, uh, an associate director for science, the associate director for science at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, also known as LASP. He is the principal investigator for the MAVEN spacecraft mission and newly appointed member of the National Space Council Users Advisory Group. Um, uh, he, his expertise in geology and cosmochemistry makes him a leading expert in Mars's atmosphere uh, and what it would take to make the red planet habitable. In fact, he's authored two books on the search for life in the universe and leads the team, the CU's uh, team for NASA's Astrobiology Institute. Um, if anyone knows how to create a livable Mars, it's Dr. Joukowsky. But does he think we can do it? Dr. Joukowsky, thanks so much for being with us today. Real pleasure to be here today. So, can we do it? Uh, you know, terraforming Mars, changing it to have a livable environment is not an easy task. We would have to increase the pressure in the atmosphere, increase the temperature. The best way to do that is by putting more of a greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. What's possible? CO2 is the best greenhouse gas, and Mars has a lot of CO2. But if you start adding up where the CO2 is and how much there is, and especially how easy it would be to mobilize it and put it back into the atmosphere, you get stuck. You just can't find enough to raise the temperature very much and make an environment that's very livable. So I'm going to have to say that with today's technology, it's not possible. Great. Episode over. Thanks so much for being with us. <laughs> just kidding. So, uh, sorry, that wasn't actually one of our, that's just a, a fun little thing. Uh, we'll start off with, with the question that is, might seem kind of trivial, but is important for the success of, of this episode, which is, what is astrobiology? Astrobiology is all about trying to understand the origin the distribution of life in the universe. We know that the Earth has life. It's the only place we know of that does. But we can ask the question, where else in our solar system might life exist? What about recent planets that have been discovered orbiting other stars? Could life exist there? It's all about understanding the relationship between life and its planetary environment and where conditions might be met that could support an origin of life or could support the continued existence of life. So this is kind of in contrast to what we were talking about with our other guest, which is how can we support life that started on Earth and thrive in space? Uh, but astrobiology is kind of the opposite. We're looking at life that has no relationship to Earth and is just out there, you know, living. Well, yeah, yes and no. If we think about life on Mars, for example, Mars meets all the environmental requirements we'd put forward as being necessary to support life. Things like liquid water, all of the different elements out of which you might construct life, and a source of energy either through sunlight or chemical reactions that could support metabolism. But Mars doesn't have to have had an independent origin of life in order to have life. You can have living organisms transferred between planets. On Earth, for example, there are organisms that live inside of rocks in the water that fills pore spaces in the rock. And if one of those rocks happens to get ejected by an asteroid impact, it could find its way to Mars and transfer life there. So it's possible if we find life on Mars that it might have come from Earth. It's also possible it could go the other way, that if we find life on Mars or evidence for ancient life on Mars, that could be where the origin of life occurred and life on Earth had been transferred here from Mars. That's one of the fundamental questions that I think will be really interesting to try to answer. What is the, the kind of history of this field, astrobiology? I think for a long time, humans have been wondering, you know, are we the only ones? But from a scientific standpoint, how long have, have scientists in an organized way been trying to figure out, okay, what would this take? And you know, where are we like where should we be looking? And what is this, you know, what's the history of that? Scientists have always been looking at this question of life elsewhere, but it's really gained respectability within the last, say, 20 years. 
A uh, hundred years ago, Percival Lowell was looking at canals on Mars and thinking he saw evidence for life. Uh, Nikolai Tesla was intercepting radio signals that he thought came from Mars and were the Martians trying to signal us. But I would say it's only been in the last 20 years that it's really become a hot topic. What happened is in the 1980s and 90s, we recognized that life could live in what we think of, what we humans think of as extreme environments. Life lives in the hot springs in Yellowstone at temperatures at or even above the boiling temperature of water. Life can live inside of rocks, as I mentioned. Uh, life can live in very salty environments at temperatures below freezing. And it really opened up the possibilities for where life could exist. At the same time, we were discovering that Mars meets all of those requirements, that Europa seems to show evidence for liquid ocean underneath the surface covering of ice. We were discovering that not only could life exist in a wide variety of extreme environments, but those environments occur elsewhere in our solar system. Earth doesn't appear to be the only planet on which organisms on which life could exist. Maybe there are half a dozen different places in our own solar system. That's what really opened up the uh, opened up people's eyes to the potential for life elsewhere. And also in the 90s, people were just starting to discover planets around other stars. And the recognition that planets are widespread, even though it was expected, the discovery that in fact they were meant that there would be planets within the habitable zone, that there would be rocky planets uh, that might have oceans, that might have atmospheres that could support life. The possibilities today are really widespread, uh, that life could be in an incredible number of places. That doesn't mean it is there, and that's really the function of astrobiology, to think about where are the places where life could exist and where are the places where it might really be there? How can we discover it if it is there? So then let me put this to you, and this is a question that people ask all the time. If there's so many opportunities for life to be out there, why haven't we found it yet? Why haven't, why haven't they contacted us? Why don't we see any of this life just yet? Well, there, there are a lot of really good questions locked up in that one simple question. The first is let's distinguish between microbial life and intelligent life. Uh, I don't expect microbes to contact us. Uh, they just aren't capable of building even primitive radio systems. But we can discover evidence for microbes. We've sent a spacecraft to Mars in the 1970s to look for evidence for life. It turns out in hindsight that, that the experiments on the Viking spacecraft were not really the right ones, but they were at the time based on what we knew about life. Uh, today, we would send a different set of experiments. Um, in addition, we have the issue of looking for life in what's called the Allen Hills meteorite. It's a rock from Mars about this big, about the size of, of a really big baked potato that was knocked off of Mars by an impact and came to Earth. Uh, some people think thought that they were seeing evidence for life, uh, evidence for fossil life inside of it. It took, once that proposal was put forward, it took a team of maybe 500 scientists, half a dozen years of analysis to reach a consensus on whether they were seeing evidence for life. That consensus was probably not. But it's not an easy question to answer. You pick up a rock and ask, does it have evidence inside of it for life? Uh, you have to do a lot of analysis to get a definitive answer. The question about intelligent life is a very different one. Uh, people are looking for signals that might be transmitted by intelligent life that we might intercept. And it is a fair question to ask if life is so widespread, where is it? How come they haven't come here? And there are a lot of uh, hypotheses put forward as to why that might be the case. Everything from we're so primitive, they don't wanna bother with us to uh, they're already here and just watching us, uh, biding their time until we 
demonstrate that we're a species worth interacting with. Is there that, I mean, I guess from your perspective, you know, as, as an astrobiologist in the field. I'm what, sorry, and that's what? Uh, and I said an astrobiologist. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. What did sorry, it come bad, through as? Bad, bad joke on my oh, part. Oh, ha ha, ha, nice. Final you can edit that John. out. No, 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 John, I want that to stay. You should keep that, make a note. <laughs> um, do you think that there is, you know, un, like that, that the universe should be teeming with life? Not necessarily is, but given, you know, your stance and from, you know, your perspective, it like, do you think, are you with these people that are asking that question? Well, then where is it, you know, because it should be there or it should be able I, to be. I think it's fair to ask that question. Okay. Uh, when you say should, that supposes that there is a direction toward life. That, that there's a natural evolution toward intelligent life. And asking the question doesn't presuppose an answer. It mm -hmm. says, let's go out and find it. These are questions that are amenable to experimental verification. Right. We can go to Mars and determine if there are microbes. We can go to Europa. We can uh, look, in our, uh, look in the sky with radio signals. We can try to detect evidence in the atmospheres of planets around other stars as to whether there might be life. And either answer that there is life or that there isn't, that there is intelligent life or maybe only microbial life, it's, it's going to be a profound answer. And it's gonna tell us a lot about the nature of the universe and about ourselves as a species. But whatever the answer, we can go find out. We don't have to think what should there be we can ask, what is there? Profound. I love that. So moving towards your uh, profession as a professor with the University of Colorado, uh, you teach courses across a range of subjects, um, but some of the points that you uh, like to touch on, and I'm just pulling this from your website, so I, perhaps this is false, but you can verify for us. It sounds like some of the points you like to touch on uh, are, are those related to societal and philosophical issues that relate to, to astrobiology. What are some of these issues? Well, we've been getting at some of them. Are we alone in the universe? What does that mean for our perception of who we are as individuals or as a society? People are interested in this question of life elsewhere because we are life. We exist in our planetary environment and it's of interest to know, are we alone or there are other organisms? Uh, again, I think the answer will have profound implications. If you think about it, you can look in our history for examples of how, uh, of, of what some of the implications might be. The best analogy would be the Copernican revolution, the recognition that the sun and the planets don't revolve around the earth but the earth goes around the sun. In some sense, that had the effect of displacing humans from the center of the universe. A and, and at that time when that happened, it was a really big deal. You know, does it make a difference to you or me whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun around the earth? No, you'd be hard pressed to think of ways in which it really makes a, a real difference to you in your day-to-day -day life but it's a profound difference in terms of uh, the place of humans in the universe. Uh, and, and it created upheaval at the time. There was a, uh, it's, you, can, you can imagine it started what people have called a, a big battle between science and religion. Who has control over the description of the world? I think the recognition that uh, uh, if we find life, that we're not the only life in the universe would have the same effect of displacing humans from the center of the universe, to displacing terrestrial life from the center of the biological universe. And I think it's a set of issues we'd have to deal with. I think finding evidence for life would be profound. Looking where we think there should be evidence, where there should be life if it exists elsewhere, and finding none would be profound just as well. So now that you've done a, a bit of work with the government and things like that, do you, th what do you think would happen? How would, I see this in like movies and TV all the time when we find life 
elsewhere in the universe and everybody freaks out. <laughs> Either everybody freaks out or it's not a big deal, but it's probably going to be somewhere in between, I would imagine. Do you do you feel like we as a society are sort of ready for that? Or is it going to be more of the everybody freaks out scenario? You know, that's a really hard question to answer. And I think part of it depends on where we discover life. Uh, if we discover intelligent life on the nearest star and, and we determine that they are on their way to visit us, I think people would freak out. If we discover life halfway around the galaxy where we might know of its existence, but it would take, oh, hundreds of millions of years to get here, I think it would be less of a concern. I think that everybody's going to be interested in the answer. I'm impressed when I talk to people how everybody is interested in this question of whether there's life elsewhere. I remember once getting into a taxi cab in Washington, DC and asking him to take the cabbie to take me to NASA headquarters. And he immediately started talking about the latest discoveries of water on Mars and what it meant for possible life. And I thought, wow, even the, the cab drivers are interested in this. It only bothered me a little bit that he then started talking about UFOs and alien abductions, but that's okay because he's still interested in this question of are we alone? Are we being visited? So as far as, you know, kind of to piggyback off of Chair's question, but a little sp in a specific direction, a lot of the movies that we see or books that we read or stories tend to err in this direction of, okay, we've discovered that, like you said, you know, said that we find some form of life, intelligent life on our nearest star uh, to the sun and they're on our way to earth and they'll be here, you know, in a month or something, right? There always yeah. tends to be this, this like, okay, we have to prepare for attack do you think that that is the true human nature to assume that we have to defend ourselves against whatever intelligent life, you know, say that, that, that we, you know, we're able to confirm this. Is that the right move or, or is that, I don't know. I, I'm not really actually totally sure what my question is. I'm just curious about your perspective on this, this immediate, like, okay, we have to prepare, you know, in this kind of military way, you know, for this interaction. You know, there's a wide range of, of responses to a discovery of extraterrestrial life that you see in science fiction in the movies. Uh, my favorite example and one of my favorite movies is Independence Day, where they're coming here to Earth to destroy us and take all of our resources. No idea what it means to take our resources, but they never get that far. They're just too busy destroying us. At the other extreme is a movie like Contact, which people may not remember now uh, from a couple of decades ago. It's about alien civilizations that come to Earth to try to save us, to help us save ourselves. And I think what you're seeing is the whole range, the whole spectrum of possible responses, everything from they're out to make sure we survive to uh, they're going to destroy us. And I think it's not a reflection of the nature of uh, the, the, the alien civilizations, it's a litmus test on our own view of the world. Are we uh, optimistic and we think we're going to, aliens are going to come here and help save us, that we're worthy of saving, uh, or are they going to come and destroy us? It's a litmus test of our own view of the world. So we've talked a little bit about Mars already, and we mentioned in your bio, you are the PI of the MAVEN mission. Um, can you tell us a little bit about MAVEN and kind of how that relates to astrobiology? I see MAVEN as an astrobiology mission. MAVEN is the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution Mission. The N in MAVEN is the N at the end of evolution, so it's not a true acronym. Uh, and I've taken a lot of grief for that over the years. But the, the MAVEN mission is focused on studying a uh, part of the Mars system that really hasn't been studied. And that's the top of the atmosphere. That's the boundary between the thick lower atmosphere where all the weather occurs and space. The upper atmosphere is where the sun, uh, through its sunlight, through the solar wind interacts, and it's able to strip gas off of the atmosphere. So we're, we're learning about the physics and chemistry of the Mars upper atmosphere. At the same time, we're seeing how these processes lead to loss of the atmosphere to space. And the goal of MAVEN was to understand 
what drove the climate change on Mars that we infer from the geology. We see evidence that early Mars was warmer and wetter compared to today's cold and dry desert-like planet. What drove that change? What was the role played by stripping of the atmosphere to space by the sun and the solar wind? So as, a, as an aronomy mission, which aronomy is the study of the upper atmosphere, it's perfectly fine. But really, it's an astrobiology mission. We're trying to learn what controls the climate, what controlled, past tense, the climate on Mars, what could control the climate on Mars-like planets around other stars. We're looking at things that affect the history of liquid water on the surface, things that affect the temperature of the surface, and that control the habitability of Mars by microbes. All the evidence points to the surface of Mars as having been habitable uh, by microbes at least four billion years ago, but not today. What controlled that? By understanding the relationship between climate and geology and possible biology, we're really studying the astrobiology of Mars. So in that sense, do you, would you say that pretty much all of our planetary missions to Europa or to Titan or to Enceladus, they're all pretty much astrobiology missions in a sense. I'd be hard pressed to think of one that isn't because astrobiology is really about understanding uh, in this context, the architecture of our solar system. What controlled the final end states of the planets? Why are Venus, Earth, and Mars so different from each other? Was it distance from the sun, presence or absence of a magnetic field, ultimately the size of the planet? Uh, how did these affect the climate? How did it affect what, how much uh, uh, water and other gases accreted onto them? So you need to study the small bodies in the solar system to tell us about that. What we're discovering is that the solar system is an incredibly interconnected system where the outer planets affect the inner planets. The small bodies affect both. In that same sense, Mars is a very, has in itself a very interconnected system. By studying the atmosphere, you can't really understand the climate without studying the geology. How did volcanism release gases? How much gas is locked up in the polar caps today? Uh, it's the same thing as on Earth in terms of a very complex, system to understand the full environment, except that Mars today at least doesn't have an ocean. I was just so, thinking that same thing. It's a lot like ecology here on Earth. You have to look at how everything works together to get an idea of, of the entire system. And that's a lot. The solar system is big. That's a big system. They and, say. And especially with so many places now having uh, uh, environments that might be able to support life. If we think about the places where there could be life, of course, start with the Earth, Mars, uh, Europa, which has uh, probably has an ocean underneath its ice surface, Enceladus, uh, which also seems to have evidence for an ocean underneath an ice surface, Titan, although Titan is very cold today, there are times and places where you could have liquid water and with all the organic chemistry going on, there's the potential for life. And recently I've even heard Pluto described as a possibility, even though it's so far out in the solar system, there's evidence that it may have buried oceans underneath the surface coating of ice. Uh, where else? What about Venus? Venus today probably doesn't have life, although I hear people talk about the possibility of life in the clouds. But a billion years ago or two billion years ago, Venus might have had a much more clement climate before the sun heated up and turned it into the hellish environment we see today. Could it have had life at the surface and oceans two or three billion years ago? Uh, possibly, is there any way we could see evidence for that? Probably not, unfortunately. So we're talking about all of these places in the solar system that could have life, right? That we say, okay, well, this is a, a, a thought. What 
you know, as a, as a planetary scientist, when you look around, what do you see being the necessary features of a planetary surface that sustain life or below the surface? Um, you know, like Europa, for example, you mentioned that subsurface ocean. What are we looking for when we see all these different bodies? You know, with the, the current understanding of widespread life on Earth and life living in environments that we would have thought until recently were way too extreme, we've come up with a set of criteria uh, for what could support life. And it's not very difficult. Liquid water, access to the biogenic elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and, and 22 others that are all present on any geologically active planet, and a source of energy that can drive metabolism. Uh, really, any rocky planet that also has liquid water is going to meet these. And going to these places and looking to see whether there was an origin of life, whether there ever was life there, it's going to tell us a lot about what the requirements are, as well as what the distribution of life in the solar system is. So aside from having a rocky surface and maybe liquid water, what about things like the like gas giants, like Jupiter and Saturn, who have you know really thick cloud layers? They do have a lot of these organic compounds and things like that that we're finding in these atmospheres. Possibilities, maybe? People have looked at life in the atmosphere of Jupiter, and I don't think you can rule it out. But if you start thinking about access to a source of energy, it's a very hydrogen, helium-rich atmosphere where everything else is trace gases. So it's very hard to find enough resources to support living organisms, to support metabolism, to create the uh, structures that you need to have life. It's not impossible, but that wouldn't be where I would look. Uh, I always go back to my, one of my favorite quotes from the sports writer Damon Runyon from the 1940s. Uh, he said that the race may not always go to the swift nor victory to the strong, but that's the way you bet. And if we're looking for life, I would start with the places where they clearly meet the requirements as we understand them today. Uh, Mars, Europa, Enceladus, uh, maybe Titan, maybe Pluto. Uh, I would even include some of the small, smaller asteroids because there's evidence for liquid water. Jupiter, it's on my list, but it's way far down on the list. Uh, it isn't the place I would start with. This is on the pretense that, you know, the life that we're looking for is somehow related to the life that we know. And obviously that makes sense because, you know, I think that that a lot of people have heard people say, well, we, we can't start looking for what we don't know. We have, you know, our starting place is us. We know that we exist and we know what features, you know, make our lives possible so we can look for those. What about things that, you know, do you think that there is a, a life form that doesn't operate at all like we do you know you've mentioned that you know there's these elements that we're looking for and also like a source of energy and how are we how are how are these life forms you know metabolizing and interacting with their environment like are there you know in your mind is there a way that th life could be completely different and we don't even know how we you know any way to describe what it's doing or how it's working or is that not life as, as we're talking about it well, first, it requires uh, uh, answering the question of what is life, and that's a very hard question to answer uh, by itself. Uh, but also, how do you look for it? On Earth, we have a very simple way of looking for life. If we want to go outside and see if there's life there, uh, we can pick up something, and the test is to determine whether it has RNA and DNA. On Earth, that appears to be a unique descriptor of whether something is alive or not. Now, you can imagine that there might be uh, what people have called a shadow biosphere on Earth, organisms that exist and we haven't discovered them that don't use RNA and DNA. Maybe, maybe not. If we want to go to Mars and look for life, we could take the same RNA and DNA detectors and take them there, 
But if life isn't identical to Earth life, we're not going to discover it. So you have to think of other ways to look for evidence of life. You can look for it in physical structures like cells. You can look for it in patterns of chemicals where certain chemicals are more abundant in a structure if it's been alive than if it hasn't been. You can look for patterns in the stable isotopes, uh, different flavors of atoms that have different masses where uh, certain chemical reactions or living organisms that use chemical reactions prefer one isotope to another. What are you going to find? Don't know. We're trying to come up with ways to look for life that make as few assumptions as possible uh, in order to not miss things. But we're always bound by our assumptions. Could there be life based on something other than carbon? Uh, people always talk about silicon-based life because silicon sits right below carbon on the periodic table. Well, on Earth, carbon uh, reacts with hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. It makes these nice long chains of hydrocarbons that uh, have very have properties that are, uh, at least for us, appear very conducive to participating in life. Uh, carbon can be present at, in the Earth's environment as a solid, as a liquid, as a gas. It can uh, be present in the atmosphere. It can dissolve in water. It can precipitate out as carbon minerals. It can be taken up by organisms. Silicon can do all these things too, but when silicon combines with oxygen, it doesn't make long chains. It makes these what are called silicon tetrahedra that we think of as rock. And silicon can dissolve in water, but in very trace amounts. And you don't find much silicon or silicon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's not something we breathe in. So there are limits. I don't expect to find zinc-based life. Uh, carbon is so abundant that it's not, it's probably not very limiting to assume that life would be carbon-based. Remember, silicon at the surface of the earth is 10,000 times more abundant than carbon, yet life uses carbon. Uh, it's not just based on abundance. Similarly, uh, water is a great liquid in which life can exist. It can dissolve things, it can precipitate things. If there's water on a planet, I would think it would be water-based life if there was any. But you go to Titan and you have methane, ethane oceans. Could there be methane, ethane-based life using those liquids instead of water? Uh, I wouldn't rule it out, it's not impossible. This is the part of astrobiology that kind of sends me into like an existential crisis. <laughs> the question of what is life? How do we define life? And the more I think about it, the more it, I have to stop because <laughs> it can get a little out of control. And I imagine part of this sort of restricting our view is A, we have to start somewhere, but B, we also have to sell this to government agencies to get funding for these missions. Um, I imagine it would be very difficult to sell NASA on a mission to go and look for something that we have no idea what it is or what it's going to look like, but it might be out there. Well, let, let's start. Again, you've asked a, a whole bunch of really good questions that we could spend hours talking about. Let me start with the first one. What is life? I don't think it's possible to define life. Uh, not in the same way that it's possible to define water, for example. Uh, water has a very specific chemical formula. Life probably doesn't. But we can talk about what the characteristics of life are. Uh, the most fundamental one is that life on Earth, taken as an ecosystem, involves chemical reactions in entities that are subject to Darwinian evolution. The concept of evolution is so fundamental to life as we know it that you can't talk about life without talking about evolution. But at a more basic level, uh, life takes in nutrients, it gives off waste products, it 
converts energy from one form to another. When you eat food, you convert it into motion or uh, chemicals that can be used to build structure uh, as, as you put on weight or get larger. Uh, the waste products we give off, we give off CO2. We, we get rid of the chemicals that we aren't using in ways that I don't think I need to describe out loud. Uh, life can replicate itself. Uh, humans have babies. We give birth to new life, but it's not a perfect replication. It's an imperfect replication. And that's what gives rise to the ability to evolve. The fact that you can have uh, many organisms coming, many different characteristics in organisms coming from a single organism and compete to see which one will do better. And then those characteristics can be passed off to their offspring. I think what you see is that if something has all of these characteristics or uh, most or all of these characteristics, we'd probably classify it as living. If it has few or none of them, we'd probably classify it as non-living. Uh, so it's one of these things where, you know, I think of it as the Potter Stewart definition of life. Uh, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And I think that that's what we're doing. Now, when we propose to NASA to send a spacecraft somewhere, we don't say, we don't know what we're looking for, and we're going to go out and just see what there is. We actually have to propose very specific things that we want to look for things that we want to measure, questions we want to answer. And we design a spacecraft, we design instruments to go and measure those things and to answer the questions we've asked. And hopefully we've sent a sufficiently robust system that we can make discoveries that we didn't expect as well. So, you know, we're talking about, we have to, for a lot of these things, you know, we have to convince someone that has lots of money, in this case, the government to say, okay, yes, that's a good idea. I'll give you this money so you can pursue this. Is astrobiology and missions relating to it a, a fairly, as far as like the missions that, that get funding, is astrobiology a, a hot area? Or do you think that scientists are trying extra hard to get funding for experiments like this? versus you know, whatever, we, whatever funding has been given in the past to other missions without the, the kind of context of searching for life? I don't think most planetary scientists think of themselves as being part of this endeavor of searching for life. I think a large fraction think that answering questions about life is important, but answering questions about how planets work is important. The way I see it though, it's all part and parcel of the same endeavor. If we want to understand where life could exist, we need to understand what the characteristics of planets are. If we want to understand the broadest possible distribution for life, uh, how widespread could it be? We need to understand the, the processes that lead to different outcomes on planets. What controls the architecture of our solar system? Why are all the planets different from each other? And how might those processes play out in a different planetary system? What outcomes might we expect? So it's really all part of a spectrum where, where some people, you know, if you go to the extreme, there are people who are interested in black holes and they talk to people who are interested in galactic evolution and they talk to people who are interested in stellar evolution and they talk to people who are interested in planets around other stars, and they talk to people who are interested in the planets in our solar system, it all connects up. Uh, I don't, I'm interested in the planets in our solar system. I don't really talk to people that do black holes, but we talk to people who talk to people who talk to each other because it's all an interconnected system. Very cool. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess that question was kind of a poor one in the sense that it assumed these hard boundaries between questions that people are trying to answer, when in fact, it doesn't have to be that way. And just in the same sense of trying to answer the question of what is life, you can ask, what is a planet? How can we define a planet? And what you find is that reasonable, thoughtful people 
disagree on what is or isn't a planet. And if you line up all the objects in our solar system, say from uh, biggest to smallest, and say, where do you draw the line between a planet and a non-planet? I might put the line here. My colleague might put the line here for different reasons, but no less valid reasons. In a continuum of objects like planets and, and objects in our solar system, there's no single line. Similarly, if you talk about life, it may be that there's no single line between living and non-living. You might have things that are on the boundary, like viruses. People are talking a lot about viruses these days, and we still can't agree on whether it's living or non-living. A, th- a question came to my mind, and then you talked about viruses, and then I, that erased the question that had come to my mind before you said that, because I was thinking, oh yeah, I remember from biology in 10th grade, we talked about viruses. Uh, oh, I was going to ask, as two planetary scientists, I'm in the middle of my screen here, so both of you are on my sides here. <laughs> what is your perspective? What, is, what are your thoughts on the eight-planet system that we have today? Is that too restrictive? Is it not restrictive enough? Just really quick, I'm curious about your opinions. Uh, you know, in the same sense of, of the, the objects in our solar system represent a spectrum, I think it's more important to talk about the processes responsible for controlling the evolution of objects. And it's less important whether something is called a planet or called a non-planet. You know, Pluto, when it changed its official designation from a planet to a dwarf planet, which is still a planet, uh, Pluto didn't change. And the processes going on on Pluto didn't change. Uh, only our classification, how we label it changed. Yep, I feel exactly the same way. I think it's, you know, and I I was really excited to have this whole uh, dwarf planet show that I was going to do at Fisk, and then we shut down and I didn't get to do it. But a big chunk of that was me being like, well, A, this Pluto is not the first planet to be change classifications you know Ceres was originally a planet and then it was an asteroid and now I guess it's a dwarf planet again but some people still call it an asteroid like it it it's definitely it doesn't matter what we call it arose by any other name you know it's it's still a really cool thing to go and look at and check out and there's all sorts of great stuff going on there who cares you know I'm I'm I specialize in moons but I call them planets all the time to me Europa's a planet every time I tell somebody about it you know so it's it's the nomenclature I think is much less important than the like you said the processes and the really cool stuff that's going on there that said though having a well understood nomenclature lets us talk about objects. You know, if I talk about the terrestrial planets, you know I mean Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. If I talk about the gas giants, you know I mean Jupiter and Saturn, and we can have a debate as to whether I also mean Uranus and Neptune. But if I talk about the ice giants, you know I mean Uranus and Neptune, even though they probably don't have ices, they have things that we normally think of as ices but in a different environment. It helps to have names, but planet is a very high level name and it doesn't help us much. You know, Earth and Jupiter are both planets, but they probably have less in common than Earth and Europa or Jupiter and the sun have a lot in common too. The argument that I've heard in in defense of nomenclature and, you know, being nitpicky about what we call planets is what especially young kids learn in school, because right now, you know, it seems to be, at least when I was in school and a lot of other people, that you learn about the planets and you learn that there are things called dwarf planets and asteroids, but they're not so focused on as, okay, let's memorize the names of these eight planets and kind of something about them is, I mean, I just... I don't know, that's not really an important point, but that's, you know, the the one argument that I've heard as far as like why it would be important to call something a planet such that it doesn't get forgotten when it's being taught to young people. You know, at the same time, young people also have an interest in dinosaurs. And I don't remember the same controversy when they changed the name of the Brontosaurus 
uh, when they realized that that the type example had the wrong head on the wrong body. You know, it didn't create an uproar. So I think kids are pretty adaptable. That's a great point you make. <laughs> and on that point, and this is something that I've asked a couple other people too, why do you think Pluto was such an uproar when this happened? Why are people so emotionally invested in this little guy? <laughs> I'm not going to touch that one. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. I don't even play one on TV. And when you start getting into individuals' motivations, all you can do is get in trouble. Fair enough. <laughs> Good save. All right, so so we'll move on a little bit into you, what you do. Uh, and one of those things is writing books. You've written two of them. Um, that they're called The Search for Life on Other Planets and Science, Society, and The Search for Life in the Universe. I'm curious, what drove you to write these books? Like when, what, you know, made you say, okay, I, it's now my time to write a book. And also, what's it like to write a book? Because that's pretty cool. It certainly wasn't a money-making proposition. I, I didn't set out to be rich. You know, the, the first book on, on life in the universe, uh, the, the physical environments, everything from stars to planets to oceans and atmospheres to possible life, the history of life on Earth. What pushed me down that path was the recognition that when I talked to students, when I taught classes for undergraduates, they were interested in the questions about life in the universe. I remember my first classes in planetary science didn't have any discussion of life. Then I added one day, we'll talk about life on Mars uh, and the Viking missions. Uh, that one day expanded into a week and it eventually expanded into a whole semester because I realized that that's what the kids were interested in. And it's not because they were way out in left field. Uh, they were expressing something that was inside of everybody, that interest. and. I explored it in depth. I started to understand the issues and how it all came together. This was in the 1990s at the same time that we were recognizing just for the first time, the possibilities for life elsewhere. And I thought, how cool, I wanna share this. So I wrote a book. Uh, at the time, I think it was the first book in what I would call the modern era of understanding the possibilities for life in the universe. Uh, and it was, to me, almost a life-changing event to explore in detail all of these different disciplines and how they come together changed my view of the world dramatically. Uh, and I realized, along with everybody else, how important the questions about life in the universe were and how fundamental they were to the science that we were engaged in. And so you said, you know, you, you, that's like how the inception of the book, what's the process of writing a book like? I've never talked to an author firsthand that's written two books to just ask, wait, what's it like to write a book? How does that work? Well, I, I've seen a good description of it. You just sit down in front of a blank piece of paper and cut open a vein and it just all pours out. Uh, it's very daunting if you think of it as writing a book. But if you break it down into chapters, each one is very straightforward. Uh, in that, that book, uh, I can't remember right now, I had about 20 chapters. And each one, when I sat down to write it, was very well defined. It was about 10 pages, uh, 10 pages of single, 10 or 20, I forget now, pages of single space typed uh, uh, verbiage. And I know how to do that. It's very, very easy if you know what you want to say uh, to write down the words. Uh, the hard part is thinking about what you want to say, organizing it, and making sure you've got everything covered. That said, it took me about two years to write, uh, write that book because I also had other things that I had to do uh, with my time. I would say it was about a year of effort spread over two years. And I remember when I was done, holding this manuscript in my hands and thinking, 
Uh, if I took this and just threw it in the trash can right now and walked away from it, it still would have been worth doing because of the impact it had on my thinking about how everything fit together in the universe. That is awesome. At it. I, love I, it. I didn't do that. I didn't, <laughs> yeah. throw it, but I thought about uh, what, what it would mean. It was just an interesting realization. That's very cool. Do you think that um, having experience writing scientific papers kind of helped with that, breaking it into 10 and 20 page chunks? It's, it's very much like submitting a paper. That's the point I was trying to make, that, that I know how to write a paper. I know how to write 10 pages because I've been doing that my whole career. So once I could break it down into 10 page chunks, it was very straightforward to write. Not easy. It still took a lot of effort, a lot of time. Uh, I can't tell you how many nights and weekends I spent working on that, but uh, it was straightforward. So one of the things we always like to ask at kind of the end of our interviews is, do you have any advice for any young people or students, college students or adults for that matter, who uh, are really interested and want to get involved in astrobiology in this search for life? There's a million ways to get involved in the questions about life in the universe. If you're interested in being an academic, you can approach it from almost any discipline. Uh, I, I was trained in planetary science, but you can come at it from geology, from astronomy, from atmospheric science, from geophysics, uh, on the biology side, from evolutionary biology, molecular biology, uh, really from any form of discipline, from chemistry, biochemistry, uh, just whatever your worldview is, lets you come at it from that perspective. As a non-academic, there are still a million ways to get involved. There are non-academics who work on space missions, uh, doing the non-technical aspects of it. Uh, there are ways to work through museums, through other public forums to engage with people and get them excited about it. Teachers, uh, librarians, everybody can be involved. And I, I think that, that that carries over. When I do my work in my office at CU, uh, I think about the secretaries, the people who staff the front desk, the janitors, they're all contributing to space exploration from their own perspective. That's a nice way to, it's very inspiring to say, oh, I don't have to, you know, have a PhD in astrophysics to go and do something, you know, like that matters in this way. I've some also- of, Some of my colleagues say, if you wanna go into this, you have to be smart, you have to work really hard. That's a great way to discourage people from doing it. Uh, what I would tell people is, it is so much fun. The idea of thinking every day about the implications of life in the universe, of thinking about how to search for it, of designing and implementing a spacecraft mission. These are really cool and exciting things. And I'm incredibly lucky to have been able to spend uh, my career so far working on them. In your circle of people, the, or just, you know, in science in general, and I guess Tara, this can also kind of apply to you seeing that you are actively researching is it a, a, an expected thing to get burnt out? I know that after doing the same thing long enough, it's just normal human nature to say, man, astrobiology is cool, but wow, I've been doing it for a million years. Or is it something so special that, you know, even after so much time, you're like, I'm still so excited about this and it's never going to stop. Let me give you an example uh, to try to answer that. Uh, I, I have a public talk, a number of public talks that I put together that I give. And when astrobiology was really coming to the fore in the 90s, in the first decade of the 2000s, I was getting asked to give this talk a lot. And I've probably given it a couple of hundred times. And I keep thinking, <clears throat> I keep thinking, I'm going to go flat on it. I'm going to get so tired of it. Uh, of this talk, giving the same talk, making the same jokes. 
and every time I get about a quarter of the way through it and I just get excited all over again. Uh, the day-to-day -day work of what I do is actually pretty boring, but the topic is so exciting it keeps me going. Uh, you know, again, to work on questions that are so profound as how does our solar system work? Is there life elsewhere? Uh, what could be more engaging and exciting? Even if all I do to do that is sit in front of a, a computer screen and answer emails and uh, pour over budgets every day. That's exactly what I was thinking too, you know, sitting and, and running the same simulations with slightly different parameters for hours and hours and hours does get a little repetitive when you've been doing it for a couple of years. But in the at the end of the day, it's like, this is really cool. And, you know, I can take the results of this and show it to people and they think it's awesome. And that's really exciting. And I'll put it back to you, Colin. It's the same thing as being a presenter at the planetarium. Do you ever get tired of doing a stars and planets talk? I no thought this times you've done them. Right. I thought the same thing when Bruce said, yeah, well, I've done this one talk. It's kind of the same thing. I have like a box of like maybe 20 jokes that I use. And, you know, there's most of these <laughs> talks are similar. They're based off the same films or same, you know, website show descriptions or whatever. And you're right. Every time I go in and the first, you know, the first couple minutes, people just start to get so excited and people are laughing and they're having a good time. And there's oohs and ahs when we make it dark for the first time. And it, you're right. It's never each time. It's just like, wow, this is something really cool to be working on. Well, uh, Bruce, we have one last question for you. And uh, I have no idea how this is going to go, but we'll just throw it out there. <laughs> I, this is personally for me. I don't want to involve Tara in this in case this goes south. I wrote this. This is my question. This ought to be good. What are your thoughts on the movie The Martian starring Matt Damon? Oh, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, really? A thoroughly enjoyable movie. Uh, but then I was a big fan of The X-Files too. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I watch a movie like that and I can watch it with two different frames of mind. On the one hand, I can sit there and pick it apart and identify all the problems. And for discussions in my classes, I've done that. I've listed all the things that I thought they did wrong. And some of them are pretty subtle. Uh, some of them are, are really big deals. Uh, at the same time, well, not at the same time, but I can sit down and watch it and just thoroughly enjoy it as a science fiction movie. I thought it was incredibly well done. It was gripping, a uh, lot of fun. Very cool. That's a great answer. I was kind of expecting you to, I part of me was like, what if he just logs off? What if it just, his picture just disappears? <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's how that went. So I'm really happy. That's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's something that I've talked with people about too I think a lot of times I don't know if it's if it's the way that we're educated or trained as scientists is to we're almost trained to be skeptical and to ask questions and to go into these things my husband gets mad at me all the time because we'll be watching a movie and I'm like I don't think that would work that way and I don't mean it from like a bad perspective I don't want to rip on it but it's just my brain going like Ooh, that's interesting. Let me see if I can figure that out. Whether it's, you know. I've, I've done the same thing. Uh, sat there watching a TV show, The X-Files is a good example where they had a whole series of episodes on uh, life in the Martian rock. And I started picking apart, well, they wouldn't do that analysis. They wouldn't send it to uh, NASA headquarters. They'd send it to Johnson Space Center to analyze. Uh, that gets old fast if you're sitting next to your significant other. You know, I, uh, one of my favorite movies I mentioned is Independence Day. I don't sit there and pick that apart for all the problems. Uh, you just enjoy it as a movie. It's almost like sitting, I have a really good friend who is a film student and loves to, uh, from a cinematic standpoint, really critique movies like a lot. And it's, it's true, you know, sitting with watching movies with him, I just am, you know, after a while, I'm like, man, like, you know, that's probably true. You're right. Harry Potter 4 does have this almost black and white filter over the whole thing, but it's such a fun movie to watch. And, you know, and so that's, a, yeah, 
I don't know, just rambling now, but there's my two cents. <laughs> well, but both parts are important. Uh, you want to get lost in a movie, but you also want to think about what it means, what parts are realistic, what parts aren't. Uh, Harry Potter, very little is going to be realistic. The Martian, a uh, lot more. Uh, it all adds to understanding the movie. All right, so Dr. Bruce Joukowsky, thank you so much again for joining us. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, it's always a pleasure.